Hi, I'm Art Hildreth. Uh, our break is over. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and I'm medical director for the Physicians Health Program and have been uh, that, that since 2016. It's been a real privilege to work with doctors who've been affected professionally and sometimes personally by addiction, uh, medical, psychiatric, and behavioral issues, and voluntarily have asked for assistance. Um, and I would like to, at this point, introduce Astrid Richardson Ashley, who will in turn introduce herself and then the next speaker. So thank you so much for... Thanks, Dr. Hildreth. Good morning, I'm Astrid Richardson Ashley, a senior clinical manager with the MPHP. I've been with the program for seven years and it has been a privilege to work with our amazing team and partners to assist physicians and allied healthcare professionals. I truly love this work and being a part of this village as Dr. Albanese discussed. It is my honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michael J. Barron. Dr. Barron is the medical director of the Tennessee Medical Foundation Physicians Health Program. He obtained an MD and MPH degree at Tulane University. He completed his anesthesiology residency at Washington University in St. Louis and his psychiatry residency at Vanderbilt University. He is board certified in anesthesiology, psychiatry, and addiction medicine. He is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Vanderbilt University. In 2006, he published original research showing that high dose opioids increased chronic pain scores. Dr. Barron was appointed to the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners in 2010 and reappointed in 2015. He helped write many different Tennessee Department of Health rules pertaining to the treatment of pain prescribing controlled substances, and office-based opioid treatment. He also served on two work groups for the Federation of State Medical Boards on physician sexual misconduct and physician health impairment and illness. Dr. Barron resigned from the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners in January 2017 to accept the medical director position of the Tennessee Medical Foundation Physicians Health Program. Dr. Barron also holds the office of the President of the Federation of State Physician Health Programs. I'll turn it over to Dr. Michael J. Barron. Thank you very much for that, for that nice introduction, which every time I hear it, it is exhausting. But um, we are going to talk about uh, professionalism, burnout, and moral injury. And thanks for having me this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a little bit about my disclosure. Um, I, I, my full-time job is the medical director of the Tennessee Medical Physician Health Program. I do some work for our malpractice carrier for this area um, and uh, do some work for the Tennessee Medical Association as far as lectures and uh, creating continuing medical education. I've been around really all sides of physician health uh, that started with being an active addict and alcoholic. I got in recovery with the help of the Physician Health Program about 25 years ago. I've been on the treatment side, other than being a participant or a client in a treatment center, I ran or was medical director of a high-end treatment center that had a professional's program. I've been on the regulatory side of it with the, with the Board of Medical Examiners. I've been on the physician health side of it as a participant and now as the medical director of the Tennessee Medical Foundation. So I've been all over physician health. And it's really, as I keep saying, it's, it's the most rewarding job I've ever had is this position I have now is helping physicians and other licensees um, navigate their illness, their impairment to get repaired uh, without punitive actions. Um, our program, if we have time, I will talk about it at the end. It's kind of the classic physician health program. It's a 501c3 a nonprofit foundation, but we may not have time for that. We are going to talk about physician health and wellness, boundary violations, uh, disruptive behavior, uh, addiction, impairment, things that get people in trouble with, uh, with their license, perhaps, or with their work, with their employer, or with their spouse, even, or 
or friends. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between regulatory medicine and what we do on this side of the street. So why are physicians and other healthcare licensees, it's not only restricted to physicians, but I'm going to mainly talk about physicians. Uh, why are they such at high risk for these problems? And it's really because they are perfectionistic. Um, they tend to work um, 60, 80 hour weeks. Now that's changing from generation, from the baby boomers to generations X, Y, the millennials and the generation Z. Uh, they're getting smarter about what they will work. And as we heard just, just prior, you know, their, their training is very changed over the years from doing everything like drawing uh, blood counts in the morning, starting IVs, to um, doing less of that, what we call scut work, uh, to, to just practicing more medicine. So their training is changing, the hours are changing, and their working may be smarter and not working as hard. But they're still the Lone Ranger Syndrome. Their positions are very isolated. Uh, they wear masks. They don't share their emotions about what they're seeing. They see patients on the worst day of their life and they don't react, they respond clinically. But those reactions, when we see humans at their worst, when they have you no know, knife wounds, gunshot wounds, horrible diseases that end their lives, though those add up over time and are you know, what we call emotional abscesses that need to be drained. And the way you drain emotional abscesses through therapy. So most physicians don't believe in therapy. They think that they don't need it. Um, we put our patients first. We leave our spouses and our children that are more sick than the people we take care of in our offices, including our own self. We put the patient's needs first. Um, and we have this thing, never show weakness, you know, respond, but don't react with, ah, what is, what am I seeing here? What do I know? I'm, I'm in over my head. We're, we're taught never to say that. Um, and, you know, um, lunches for wimps and all those terrible things that we hear, uh, but we still hear them. And we are willing to delay our personal gratification for career goals. You know, we all here in our offices in the physician health world, I'll be happy when I graduate med school and start making a little money, be treated like a real doctor. And then I'll be happy when I graduate my internship and actually get treated like a resident. And then in residency, I'll be happy when I graduate residency, start making money uh, so I could pay back my student loans. And now we're hearing also, I'll be happy when I retire. Um, and, and the sad thing with all that is, is that happiness is not a future event. Happiness is a present event. It happens now, here and now, in the present, not in the past, and certainly not in the future. So those, you know, and I, I spend a lot of time speaking with physicians all over the state and sometimes all over the country, as I'm doing now, and uh, try to try to explain that happiness is a is a is a present and mindfulness. I love mindfulness. Helps people to. Uh, attain happiness in the present moment. Um, some of this work is really old, but still is true. 80% of physicians have obsessive compulsive personality traits. It's not the disorder because it works for them. It helps them get through undergrad to, to get into medical school, helps them get through medical school because they, they, again, delay personal gratification. They don't go play intramural sports. They go to the library and they study and they check and they recheck. And I love this quote by... Um, Dr. Glenn Gabbard, who also wrote Psychodynamic Psychiatry book, herein lies the grand paradox. Compulsiveness and excessive conscientiousness are character traits that are socially valuable but personally expensive. Society's meat is the physician's poison. Society's meat is the physician's poison. And that is so true. Our patients want us to be perfect. And yet we're human. We're, we're, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have a bad you know, outcome, we're not gonna be perfect. We can aim for excellence. And the difference between excellence and perfectionism is very small uh, as far as a sum total gain, but it takes a lot of time, effort, and sweat to get there, as you can see in this cartoon graph. But we wanna be perfect and we can't be perfect and aim for excellence. And we're also considered safety sensitive occupational workers because our own health impacts the population that we're treating. Uh, and it's a privilege to be a safety sensitive occupational worker. That got coined by the Reagan administration, really around the federal workforce. 
but it has taken off you know, to include uh, other people and other workers, including physicians, including airline pilots, nuclear engineer, train engineers, um, boat captains. Um, so uh, we are that population of workers, and it's a privilege to be there, but our own illnesses can impact how we perform at work. And as a physician health program, we want to get to physicians upstream of impairment while there's still illness before there's impairment and potential patient harm. So medical boards all over, there's 72 medical boards across the United States jurisdictions. Um, some states like Tennessee have both an allopathic board and an osteopathic board. Some states and jurisdictions just have one board. But they all use these terms, unprofessional, unethical, dishonorable behavior. Unprofessional, unethical, dishonorable behavior. It's not described anywhere in the statutes that um, govern the practice of medicine, but um, it's kind of like the Supreme Court said of pornography. Uh, we can't define it, but we'll recognize it when we see it. And that's how medical boards take action on somebody's license when they determine that that behavior was unprofessional, unethical, or dishonorable. And generally, there's about four or five things that represent this types of unprofessional, unethical, dishonorable behavior. Disruptive or distressed behavior. Burnout in its... Um, at, at, at its end game, um, substance use disorders, and of course, boundary violations. And the quickest way to lose your license is by professional sexual misconduct or boundary violations. Um, I always like this because it really says that board certification may make you, may not make you a better physician, but it does help you stay out of trouble. And this was a very large study about three or four years ago that, um, Surgeons who were not board certified tended to have much more um, actions um, from the um, medical boards than surgeons that were, were board certified. So if you're out there, get your board certification. That helps you in a way that's you know kind of reactive and not proactive, but gets you out of trouble, can help you stay out of trouble rather. So the, the, the unprofessional behavior that I, I, I spoke about you now is, is, is pretty clear. But I want to talk about illness and impairment for a second. We are human. We are permitted to have illness as a physician workforce. We are not permitted as a safety sensitive occupational worker to work if that illness causes impairment. I did a medical internship at Charity Hospital in New Orleans right out of med school. And Charity was a great teaching institution. It closed after Katrina, unfortunately. But it was split by Tulane and LSU. And on even nights, Tulane admitted, and on odd nights, LSU admitted. So how we did the emergency room was the same way. On um, even nights, it was Tulane, odd nights, LSU. I was a Tulane intern. And we spent four weeks in the medical emergency room and four weeks in the surgical or trauma emergency room, as every intern would. It was on 24, then off, then on, and we could not take our two weeks of vacation, our measly two weeks of vacation during those um, eight, eight weeks. But I remember one night in the surgical emergency room, I was there as the intern, there was some medical students, there was a second year surgical resident and a fourth and fifth year surgical resident. Uh, there were no uh, attendings at Charity Hospital except on Saturday mornings to make rounds with the med students. It was a resident run hospital and a great place for training. We started our own IVs there and did everything else there. Um, but oh, one night in the trauma emergency room, we we're making rounds as surgeons do, you know, around the clock. And the, the chief resident, the fifth year surgical resident was making rounds, holding an IV pole, receiving IV fluids. And he was green, he was sweating, he was febrile, he looked terrible. He wasn't really paying attention, wasn't able to pay attention. And he was making rounds. He was impaired on the job. And at the time, being young and kind of dumb, I thought, what a cool guy. He's here. He should be upstairs in a bed on the ward or at home in bed, but he's making rounds. And now I think in, in my position and I know with a lot more smarts, what a knucklehead he was. He was impaired. And if we had any, you know, level four, or, you know, what we call room four 
traumas, like major gunshot wounds, accidents, knife wound, whatever, that night, he was the guy bringing him to the OR. Luckily, that night, no, it was a quiet night, and, and but yet he was impaired on the job. And I'm really grateful now that I could recognize that as not something that's a smart thing to do. Uh, one thing that gets... Dr. Um, Barron, yes. my, my apologies, excuse me. We're not able to see your slides. Um, I mean, and this is a great talk, um, but um, for whatever reason... Well, let me unshare and then I'll share again. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, is, is that a change? Were you able to see my slides? No. Are you seeing them now? Now we, are, now we have them. Thank you. I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, no, I'm glad because um, slides are helpful. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, please interrupt if they go away again. Um, <laughs> social Thanks. media can also get people in trouble. And I've thrown this slide in, in this talk fairly recently because we, we had a case that got referred to us by the licensing board of a young resident that had some really lewd um, social media stuff. Um, and I'm not on social media except for LinkedIn and I've never been, it's just, I don't have the, like, the time for it. But um, be careful what you post on your social media sites because future employers will look at that. Medical boards will certainly look at that when, if, if and when there's a complaint about you, even if the complaint's not related to um, social media. So be careful what you post because it follows you around for many, many years to come. Um, so one of the things that gets physicians in trouble is distressed or disruptive behavior. So what is disruptive behavior? Well, that's a physician that exhibits a chronic pattern of contentious, threatening, intractable behaviors. It's just inappropriate in the workplace. It creates an atmosphere that interferes with efficient and effective workflow. Why do we care about it? Because it causes patient harm. We were referred a physician, surgeon again, from Livingston, Tennessee, which is just north of Cookville Crossville. It was a small emergency access hospital. And his office gave orders for uh, a patient visit to be admitted to same-day surgery to be placed on telemetry. Um, and it was for a central line. She had some sort of a cancer and was re requiring chemotherapy. She was obese. She needed a central line. She also had uh, in a, a um, supraventricular arrhythmia. So he wanted her on telemetry one minute. Well, when he gets to the hospital about an hour late, he starts screaming at the nurse, the same day surgery nurse, that his patient's still in the waiting room and not on telemetry. And um, he became very upset, was dropping the F-bomb and all this is on videotape. The hospital has a good video security system. It's, it's, a, it's a single floor, like 12-bit hospital. It's small, but they do have an OR. Anyway, he starts screaming, dropping the F-bomb, and, and the nurse very purposely says, I'm out of here. So she walks away, and he walks after her, you know, walking down the hallway screaming at her. Meanwhile, the patient gets up and leaves and says, this guy's not operating on me. He's crazy. And she walks out. The whole bottom line of this is that the hospital doesn't have telemetry. So they couldn't even do the one order that he wanted that he was so upset about. So he got referred to us, not the, the, the medical board, and tries to justify it like, well, no, this was a patient care issue. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a champion for, for my patient and I want them, you know, taken care of. But he didn't get that this was disruptive to the care of the patient. And that's why disruptive behavior, you know, 30, 40 years ago, when, you know, a um, surgeon threw a scalpel in the OR, everyone kind of laughed and looked the other way. And then the AIDS epidemic came and the blood was all of a sudden lethal. So all that got, you know, really shut down quickly. But hospitals don't like disruptive or distressed behavior because they get sued for it, for maintaining or creating a hostile work environment. Patients don't like it because it impacts their care. The other aspect of this is that it breaks down in communication. If an intern resident or you know, early career physician is going to call someone for help, but no, they'll get yelled at, they're not going to call. They'll try to figure it out themselves or they'll call someone else that's not affiliated with the care of that patient. So there's a breakdown of communication, which causes mistakes um, and an increased risk for litigation, as we said, and medical boards view it as unprofessional, unethical, dishonorable behavior. 
boundary violations. The quickest way to lose your license in any state is to have sex with your patient. Do not have sex with your patients. That is a boundary violation. The, the fundamental interaction in healthcare is that therapeutic alliance that's developed when a physician and patient can meet. Now they shake hands, the physician looks at the patient in the eyes, not the computer. They, they engage with the patient. How can I help? What can I do to help you with your health care problem? And that's kind of magical. That's the art of me- part of the art of medicine, where you bond even emotionally with the patient. And you know, it says it's uh, the keystone to quality care is developing that therapeutic alliance. But when that is violated, for anything other than about patient welfare, that's a boundary violation. And that happens a lot, especially in Nashville, where I'm from, Music City, There's everyone's a singer-songwriter, everyone's a VIP, I'll get you backstage passes, you know, do this for me and I'll get you back, I need your cell phone, backstage passes. And many, many patients want your cell phone for access. They want to be able to call you up at, you know, Saturday night, hey, I need a prescription or, I'm going through withdrawal. I just you know ran out of my hydrocodone or oxycodone or whatever it is that they're prescribed. And they'll trade. And uh, the AMA Code of Ethics says you shall not accept a gift over $25 in value. Well, $25 in value, you know, with inflation, that's that's kind of a ridiculous amount these days. But how we used to handle it when I was in private practice is when uh, like a patient would bring in a uh, like a honey baked ham or um, spiral sliced ham or a good box of good have a chocolate, which I love chocolate. It's my one addiction still. And now that's over 25 value. So how I would handle it was I just put it in the break room for the office and everyone would take a slice or a piece of chocolate. So it would get around. But if, if when patients offered me, you know, hey, I got, you know, this um, inside tip on a stock or backstage passes to, you know, Led Zeppelin or, you know, Brooks and Dunn or one of these newer guys, I would say no, because they want something in return. It's a quid pro quo for, you know, I'll help you, now you help me type of thing. And what they want is access. They want access to you. So it's very appropriate to have that green line, that physician-patient relationship. That, that, that's, that's, that's appropriate. But when that patient has another type of relationship with you, like a spouse, like a best friend, like an office nurse, it starts to blur real quickly. Um, the worst case, and I can't, I'm able to share this because it is not confidential, it's in the newspapers. We have a state senator here in Tennessee who's also a physician, who's also a friend. And he's a really good physician. He's in a rural county. He's the only physician in the county, family practice doc. He's also a state senator, not, not federal, but state. Anyway, he grew up in the county, a woman who he was a second distant cousin to grew up with them they were friends they were childhood friends they were distantly related um he becomes a physician he hires her to run his vaccination program in his office she likes what she does she goes back to school becomes a nurse he hires her as a nurse she goes back to school becomes a advanced practice nurse he hires her as advanced practice nurse he's divorced she goes through a divorce and they have a sexual relationship He's also treating her with controlled substances and treating her her children with stimulants, controlled substances. Um, Again, all this was in the newspaper because during her divorce, uh, there was a public uh, thing in the court where she disclosed this. The newspapers ran with it. Now on page like two of the local newspaper. So the medical board now opens an investigation and puts his license on probation for this boundary violation, which was very fleeting. The sexual uh, part only happened for about three weeks, but yet it happened. So he was sleeping with his um, office nurse, office staff, um, lover and best friend and distant second cousin. They're like six levels of relationship with that. The AMA, again, going back to their code of ethics, which are ratified by most medical boards says, before having a intimate relationship with a patient, you must first discharge that patient from your care. The APA, the American Psychiatric Association, takes it many steps further and says, once a patient, always a patient. You may never have a sexual relationship with a patient. 
even if you're no longer treating them for like 20 years. So professional sexual misconduct is the worst type of boundary violation. And even that has a gray area in the middle from the lovesick physician to the predatory physician on the other side. And the predatory physicians are like the Larry, Larry Nassers of the world, the USA gymnastics um, physician that um, sexually abused many young women, even with their parents in the room. So chaperones don't work unless the chaperone are trained to know what to look for. And uh, it was a horrible situation and he's in jail. I think he was killed actually or stabbed or something. But it also happened you know, to a OBGYN from California and one in New York. And it's not that uncommon, unfortunately. So what is professional sexual misconduct? It's patient physician sex of any type. I would say jokingly, unfortunately, not the Bill Clinton sex, but any type of sex. Uh, so on the physician side, there's grooming. And grooming is that key word where you kind of prep the patient for sexual misconduct down the road. So you spend more time with the patient, move appointments to a Friday afternoon when there's fewer people in the office or Saturday morning. And you start to disclose stuff like, you know, well, the last patient was really a nutcase or, uh, you know, I'm unhappy at home or, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is. And over time, you groom the patient, you start to hug the patient, do the hugging thing. And eventually you have a sexual relationship with the patient. Now, the flip side of that is that the patient doesn't think you're just you know, Mr. Wonderful or Miss Wonderful. Sex and uh, gender in this case does not matter. It could happen to uh, female physicians or male physicians. But on the patient side, they want something. And what do they want? They want your prescription pad. They want access to controlled substances. And as soon as that skin line is crossed, they will say, I need a prescription. For what? Well, you know, I have some chronic pain. I need a hydrocodone. So you write a prescription, you put it in the chart, and then say, well, I need one for my, you know, spouse or my brother or my sister or children or parents or friends or whoever. And then they drop the bombshell. Well, if you don't do it, I'll, I'll report you to the medical board. They know the rules better than you do, unfortunately. And they will, um, you know, squeeze you until you are, you know, in way in in way over your head is what I guess that push A is. Um, and you'll get in trouble um, and you will get your license suspended, summarily suspended, which is, is done even in Tennessee without your permission or even knowledge. Uh, then you get a, you know, a certified letter. Y your license has been summarily suspended. Please respond within one week um, and no longer practice. So the bottom line between sex with patient, it's never acceptable. It can never be consensual because there's always a disparity of power. When you initially meet that patient, you have all the power. The physician has all that power. You do the exam, you, uh, you know, come up with the diagnosis, the treatment plan, write the prescriptions, write the follow-up orders, all that stuff. When there's sex involved, that disparity of power changes. Now the patient has the power, um, but initially you have all power. So there's a disparity of power, which is why it can never be consensual, even when physicians say it was consensual. Um, I don't have time for another case discussion about it, but um, uh, the onus is always on the physician, the one with the power initially. So what are the consequences? In 13 states, there's civil, rather criminal prosecution. There could always be a civil lawsuit, basically malpractice, and many malpractice carriers don't recognize uh, professional sexual misconduct as a practice of medicine, so they won't represent you. You're on your own and having to pay, you know, a criminal defense lawyer and um, civil defense lawyer, like, I you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes to, to get out of this. But in um, 13 states, there's a, a criminal prosecution. And in one state, I know for sure, South Dakota, because we got referred to a neurosurgeon from there who trained at Vanderbilt, um, um, sexual penetration of a psychologically dependent patient is uh, how the criminal um, statute reads. And uh, this neurosurgeon went to jail or prison for six months and lost his license. Uh, there's almost always suspension and or revocation. 
and of course a report to the National Practitioner Data Bank. So how do you not go down these roads? Know your weaknesses. If you are attracted to a patient, discharge that patient from your care before pursuing any type of relationship with that patient. If you're a non-psychiatrist, if you're a psychiatrist, know the, the APA ethics are never. Uh, address countertransference reactions, use supervision, watch out for red flags. Um, patients will try to trap you uh, because they want the drugs and they know how to get the drugs better than you know how to not have them get the drugs. And know what to do if you cross the line, get help immediately. This is an interesting case because it's more of the lovesick position. Um, 50 year old female interns from the Knoxville area. She's treating a 40 year old that she was in a terrible marriage. Her husband was a slug, worthless, you know, just even abusive, not physically, but um, emotionally, mentally abusive. And she just fell in love with the patient. She couldn't help that type of chemistry, pheromone, I don't know what caused, but she fell in love with the patient who happened to you know was an, uh, uh, and uh, is an attorney who sh she was treating for hypertension. And she didn't know quite the rules involved. She did refer the patient to another internist before their marriage, but long after they consummated the relationship. Guess who made the complaint? It's always the ex. It's always the ex-girlfriend, the ex-boyfriend, the ex-wife, the ex-husband. In this case, the ex-husband made the complaint to the board, said, my, you know, you know, and it was a nasty complaint. I actually read the complaint and it, there were some just rude type of comments in there. Um, you know, um, my um, wife was, you know, having, he didn't even, he actually used the F word in that complaint, uh, you know, with the patient. Uh, but the board had to act on that. Every complaint has to be investigated. And if there is, evidence of a uh, you know um act against the medical practice act they have to take action so they did the least punitive action which was a reprimand and they mandated continuing medical education like a boundaries course unfortunately the american board of internal medicine revoked her board certification because of the ethics violation and then blue cross dropped her because of the loss of board certification so she had some financial consequences but she's happily married now and we, we i get an email from her about once a few months and she's um, doing well. Burnout, burnout's a big deal. So what is burnout? Burnout was first described by Christina Maslach back in the eighties. And it's really a triad of things and you really just need one symptom of it to actually qualify for burnout. But um, it's really being emotionally, like every day is Monday, every day it's raining, every day you want to pull the covers up over your head and not get out of bed. You can't have any empathy for your patients. So you walk in the exam room with your head down, look at the computer, you know, tell me what's wrong. Just no connection with the patient whatsoever, no energy for the patient, no empathy for the patient, and no reward for you of, of, of the practice of medicine, which is very rewarding, but you're not feeling that reward at all. So what are some of the symptoms of it? Just being exhausted. Now we have three realms of our life, our, our home life, our social life, and our work or school life. And burnout may originate from work or school, even for med students, but it impacts our social and home as well. So there's exhaustion, we're not sleeping well, we withdraw socially, we withdraw from family, we act out because we're on wit's end and we might have disruptive or distressed behavior. Our judgment is definitely impaired, so it's an impairing condition over time. We reach out so we can feel something with either drugs or alcohol or eating or some sort of addictive behavior. And it can morph into major depressive disorder. It can morph into suicide, ideation, or action even. Um, it's a horrible condition. It's, op it's the opposite of stressed out. Stressed out kind of feels good. Stressed out's a high energy state. Your blood pressure's up. Your heart rate's up. You know, you're, you know, you're late for work or, you know, you're just running and running. Burnout's kind of the opposite. Like, you just don't care. Oh, I'm late. I don't care. I, you know, just going through life, going through work, just not engaged in anything. And it feels terrible. Malcolm Gladwell, and I think he was in Outliers. I know I read it somewhere in one of his books, describes having meaning in work as complexity of the job, autonomy to do that job, 
and a, a relationship between effort and reward, and not just financial reward, but other types of reward. Well, in medicine, we have complexity. We have a lot of complexity, and we have a relationship of effort to rewards, but we've lost um, control. When we have to do prior authorizations and pre-certifications, when we have to call someone in another state to get a chest X-ray approved, or a CT or MR or PET or you know a tier two or three medication or one or two, however those go. I haven't prescribed meds in a long time. Um, we just we've lost it, and it's very frustrating. Um, and I think you know there's a lot of drivers of burnout, both at the individual level, the organizational level, and even the national level. But I think one of the keys is that loss of control. The EHR gets blamed a lot, but it's a lot more than that. Another quote I love is actually about 10 years old now, comes from the Atlantic. Burnout steep slope is not the result of some train wreck or examination as long call shifts or poor clinical vows. It's the sum total of hundreds of thousands of tiny betrayals of purpose. Each one so minute it hardly attracts notice. So it's like death by a million paper cuts. Um, some of the statistics pre-pandemic were really high. 55% of med students, 60% of residents, 54 point something percent of practicing physicians had at least one symptom of burnout. And then the pandemic happened and whammo, it went off the charts. But the good news is that uh, just a recent AMA Newswire from um, July is that it's uh, below 50% for the first time uh, for practicing um, physicians. Um, it was called the parallel pandemic during the pandemic and soon after the pandemic. It's gotten a lot of press about, you know, the stress that the pandemic had on the on the pay, on the physician population, on the whole healthcare population. But the ones that got hit the hardest were the pulmonologists, ICU docs, intensivists, uh, emergency room docs uh, that didn't know what was walking in the door, and those that were walking in the door weren't going home. They were going to the morgue many times, which was very unusual for ICU work, and it, it took a toll. So why do we care about burnout? Because it impacts quality care. That's the biggest reason. There's decreased quality care, decreased patient satisfaction. Uh, turnover is usually expensive for now hospitals that employ 70% of the workforce or medical groups, large medical groups. Um, um, it's usually expensive. It's like between 500,000 and a million dollars to replace a physician. So that caught people's attention too. There was a, a ICU at Johns Hopkins, a 20 bed medical type ICU at Johns Hopkins that was paying $1.5 million on nurse recruitment a year. So nurses are expensive too to retain and recruit and to, and to keep. And there's decreased productivity when you're burned out. On a personal side, divorce rates went up. Substance use disorders among physicians, which are a little higher than the general population originally, it used to be that 40% of physicians had a substance use back after the Civil War, up until about the 1920s. That's way down, but still a little bit higher than the general population. And depression and suicide rates went up with the pandemic as well. And people live in medicine. Moral distress is a really interesting concept that I really like because it is some of the paper cuts that I talked about. So moral distress is emotional experience when a physician can't do what they think is right. When they have to discharge a patient home because insurance says, you know, well, we're going to cover all we're going to cover. And the QA officer for the hospital saying, we're not going to, you know, subsidize this care, discharge the patient. And you know, it's the wrong thing to do but you do it anyway. So that's the moral distress. And as moral distress adds up, it becomes a moral injury, which is an enduring psychological, spiritual, behavior, social harm inflicted to an individual's conscience. So moral injury is a lot like post-traumatic stress disorder, as it turns out. There's a huge amount of overlap in what moral injury is, which is a trauma and just having PTSD. So kind of the overlap is the, these reactive, you know, um, uh, amygdala generated um, emotions of anger, depression, anxiety, insomnia, recreation, nightmares, and self-medication, you know, to change how we feel. 
and to protect how we feel. So the good news with burnout, it's treatable. It's recogni very recognizable. You know, a med student could you know, recognize it's not a DSM-4 or 5 or 5-TR diagnosis. It's not in the DSM, but it is a syndrome that is recognizable and is treatable. And one of the best treatments, I think, is mindfulness-based stress reduction. I love mindfulness. I think it's, you know, it's better than, um, you know, um, bread and butter. Um, other types of treatments, like individual or group psychotherapy, and if there is major depressive disorder, you have to treat that. If there are those other behaviors, boundaries, or substance use, or that, you have to treat that. And support groups can also be very helpful. We have um, 11 support groups called Caduceus Means across Tennessee, and we do invite uh, physicians with burnout syndrome to join those groups. This is one of the treatments for it, and hopefully it'll come through okay. Let me know if you can't hear it. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. So I'm gonna give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribes. Um, it, it just went a little bit more. Um... That was used with permission from Happify. I have no financial relationship with Happify. There's three apps you get for your smartphone. One is Happify, one's Headspace, and one's by Calm, C-A-L-M. I have no financial relationships with any of them, but they're, they're actually good. They quote like 11% over the first month improvement, but they have algorithms for anxiety, for um, trauma, for um, burnout. Um, and they're useful. There are gray matter changes that happen with mindfulness. Actually, the amygdala, kind of our emotional charged memory system, actually gets smaller with mindfulness. And the hippocampus, where memories process, gets a little bit larger. So there's gray matter changes that happen over time with mindfulness. And it's not only works great for burnout, but ADHD, a non-medical, um, non-medication way to treat um, ADHD. And it works great for chronic pain too. When I was in private practice treating, treating people with, with pain and addiction, I would you know, I would promote the heck out of mindfulness because it just, it works really well when someone actually does it. Um, suicide rates. The sad thing with physician suicide rates is that we don't know the number. We used to think it was about three to 400 suicides per year nationwide, which would put the suicide rate up around 40 per 100,000, and the general population suicide rate is about 13 per 100,000. We do know that female physicians are at higher risk than the general female population. We do know that the male-female suicide rates equal, 
um, men use more lethal means, more violent means than women do. But we just don't know the actual numbers because it's so poorly reported as suicide. Many suicides don't go down as suicide for financial reasons. Life insurance companies don't pay out on suicides if it's in the first year or two of the, of the policy or some policies excluded altogether. Families don't want it because it's stigmatizing. So we just don't actually know. Uh, there will be a talk at um, next April's um, Federation meeting on suicide by Christine Moutier, the, the medical or, or the medical director, I think, for a American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, but we do think it's an occupational hazard, the one cause of death that's higher in physicians than the general population. And there was a study out of Oregon that showed regulatory complaints are associated with the increase in suicide risk. Um, and suicide physicians have a unique, um, you know, face unique barriers uh, to get help because you know, they worry that it will go down on the questions as we heard on health licensure questions, as we heard um, before. Um, substance use is a big deal with physicians because of easy access. They have the same risk factors as the general population, but easy access and a little bit higher stress level and they're perfectionistic again. And they think they could treat themselves. Um, we, uh, as I say, no one ever gets through training unscathed. We're all traumatized at some level or other, uh, even if you go into psychiatry, because we see people that you know end their life by suicide. Um, the uh, American Society of Anesthesiology has films to address that, that emotions of the operating room uh, called under the mask. Um, and we learn to treat ourselves and not trust other people, not ask for help because of that fear of um, disclosure. Um, um, there's a big move right now to change health licensure questions, uh, both from you know, places like the Lorna Brain Foundation and from FSPHP. Uh, we've been in this in this work for a long time, way before Lauren Breen, about changing health licensure questions. We changed ours in 2019 here in Tennessee. Years Julie wrote them, and then they got ratified by the board. And we changed them again in 2022 to remove one question that I wanted, but the, the medical board didn't think was necessary anymore. So even the medical board is more liberal than I am about health licensure questions. Um, so who's the doc that you, we usually say it's usually the overachiever? Um, they, you know, they got through med school with all A's or high passes and they're gunners and they you know, started reaching for substances when the world wasn't as perfect as they thought it should be. Things that start early are problems at home. Um, they withdraw from social events. They get to Jekyll and Hyde personality changes. Uh, from an anesthesiologist point of view, they usually call, you know, get extra, they um, volunteer for extra shifts at the hospital because that's where the drugs come from. Or they obtain hallway consults from their peers. Hey, I got back pain. I'm going to Florida in the morning. I need a prescription for hydrocodone just to get in the car, that sort of thing. Uh, eventually, they get you know, identified by friction with administrative staff or their partners, or they get a DUI or something like that. What's scary uh, is that impairments are late finding with substance use disorders. Alcohol, people with just you know, alcohol use disorder get identified in their you know, late 40s, 50s, or 60s, not when they begin drinking heavy, which is usually in high school or maybe college even. For, well, out of one study, 43% of opioid using have been using for two years before detection. So impairments are late finding. And as a physician health program, we want to intervene upstream of impairment with illness. About 50% of physicians use alcohol, 30% use opioids, 20% use stimulants. Very few physicians use illicit drugs. That's why the overdose death rate for physicians is very low because most, our, most physicians do not go to the street for their drugs. We've had one intentional, uh, sorry, unintentional overdose in Tennessee in my eight years. And this was on someone that just completed his five-year monitoring agreement. And about three weeks later was found dead in a park, in a wooded park outside of Knoxville. And there was a bag of um, um, methamphetamine in, in his truck that was found. Uh, we think he had a heart attack, but don't know for sure. 
Um, so what are some of the barriers? Stigma. You know, asking for help is a sign of weakness. Eating, drinking, sleeping are signs of weakness. Lunch is for wimps, that's time. Sometimes there's just no time. If you're working 80 hours a week, when do you get to see your doctor or, or primary care doctor? But we know that that is not true, that asking for help is a sign of strength, that it's good to eat, drink, and sleep, and lunch is necessary. But there are some rational fears about um, health licensure questions again, or insurance panel questioning for, for fitness questions, things like that. Um, the physician personality is kind of the narcissistic, um, and we're programmed to cope alone. Um, so um, treatment, and then I'm going to quit because we're running out of time. Physicians are safety sensitive workers, so they're held to a higher degree of recovery treatment than the general population. But the good news with that is that the prognosis and the success rates are huge. They're in the 85 to 93 percent range at five years. And not only that, but after five years of monitoring with success, their risk of relapse is less than initial use for the general physician population, and the risk of a malpractice claim is less than the general population. So they're actually safer than the general physician population. And I sh shout that at the rooftops every chance I get. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but where this all started was with the, the sick physician article that was in 1973, I think, in JAMA. But um, I will make my uh, slides available uh, if, if wanted. Um, but I'm going to stop there, except to get to my end point, which is at the Physician Health Program at the very end, which is here. So thank you very much for having me. I am available for some questions. If there are any, I'm going to stop sharing now that I am sharing my slides. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron. That covered really a lot of very, I think, important information, um, but also I think touched on a lot of the conditions that are um, very relevant, um, really bothering um, folks, um, especially the the issue of stigma. And I know we heard about that a little bit, you know, from the um, um, the previous um, presentation. Um, but um, thank you so much. Um, Anybody have questions um, or, or comments? Um, can you talk about the high variability of resources that can be offered by health systems and how should they concentrate their efforts? I'm not quite sure what's being asked, but there are you know, numerous resources for physicians to get help. Um, there are many treatment programs for, we're mainly talking about um, um, substance use disorder here. There are many treatment programs that have a professional's program, which are, you know, good quality programs that, that are longer than the seven day detox or even the kind of the old 28 day uh, long um, program. Other resources that we have in Tennessee, we actually have a loan fund a loan and, and actually grant fund. We grant um, money to medical students to have an evaluation and or um, treatment. And we loan out um, up to about $15,000 um, per um, physician at a very low interest rate that they could pay back you know, when they get back to work. We're very fortunate that way. That got started about 30 years ago and has grown. Uh, and when I came in uh, eight years ago, um, it, we didn't even know we had that money, but we discovered it and said, wow, it's grown this much. And so we've uh, actually put it to use. We also got a, a grant, an opioid ab abatement uh, a grant, and we put some of that money in the loan fund to, uh, to grant and to loan to physicians. Um, it's not a moneymaker for us, but it is a service that we use. We are leaning on many GME offices to actually pay for treatment for their residents. Um, and some are actually agreeing to that. You know, they have money that they get from you know, CMS and um, that they can put to use for treatment. So there are resources out there. 
but treatment is expensive, as we all know. And uh, to pull a provider, doesn't matter what type of, out of practice, you know, not only are they having to pay for their services, they're also not making money in the office. Uh, when more physicians were like solo practitioners or in an eat what you kill type practice, th that was actually much worse. It's it's better now that they're employees of a you know, large um, medical group or medical healthcare system, um, so they could still you know declare it, uh, you know use FMLA or um, even short term um, disability money. So it's not as bad as it was, but or some of the other licensees that we cover, like veterinarians, they're, they're, they're still in that old model and probably will be for a long time. Hope that answers the question. I'm not quite sure what it was asking, but. Um, um, thank you. Um, we have another question. What advice would you give other state PHPs regarding advocacy for licensure application, employment credentialing, and insurance paneling reform? Um, I think relationships are critical here to, you know, to be known to your medical board. I go to every medical board meeting and uh, we'll have a good relationship with them. I was on the medical board, so I think it's a little easier, but still to just be known to your state and to help and volunteer when they have no rule changes or regulatory changes, you no know, volunteer to help be part of the panel that, re that re rewrites those rules. Uh, to meet with like the giants like Blue Cross Blue Shield in your state to say, you know, your your health licensure questions for the for the panel providers are still stigmatizing, and there's a movement now to change that. They're usually aware of it anyway, but it's good to just get to know them to develop those relationships, because well, we are part of the healthcare system, and many times the physician health program is not known. Um, what we we're a very old program. We're like 45 years old. We're in our 46th year. But still, if you ask the average physician what the Tennessee Medical Foundation is, they'll just scratch their head and say, I don't know. Um, and I do about 35 lectures a year across the state, you know, to the med students, to, to the um, graduating med students, to like resident grand rounds. Uh, but still, our, our, our name is not well known. Um, and that, that part's frustrating. Uh, but to develop a relationship with your state medical association, if you don't have one, to the to the um, licensing boards that you know um, are already in relationship with, maybe financially or um, ha have a charge for their licensees, uh, to develop those relationships because they're key, and then they will listen to you. Thank you, thank you. I, I think definitely two points that you made, one about financial assistance and the other one about these relationships. Um, you know, I found that those are so, uh, they're, they're really big issues um, and definitely constantly need to be looked at and, and worked on for sure. Um, are there other questions? We're, we're about out of time. Um, so I would say if we have any other questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat um, and we will um, you know, get back with them. Oops, we have one more thing. <laughs> um, we are presenting a series of lectures over the year on various subjects related to physician impairment. We will be providing at least annually a talk on boundary problems because physicians who are boundary violators often say they did not know it was unethical. Um, and this is this is actually from Dr. Tom Allen, who's been um, the chairperson for our um, the Maryland Physician Health Program's Oversight Committee for quite some time. And these are things that we really feel are um, so important and emerging. And I think you know you've you've said that, and and um, Dr. Albany said that as well. Um, once we were probably seeing a lot more substance use issues. Now it's it's tipped into other much a different areas. And whether that was because it was always there and it just wasn't brought up or it's, you know, more frequent, we, I don't know. Absolutely. I'm just, I, I guess I could disclose, I helped teach the over-prescribing course up at Vanderbilt. Now it's a 23 hour course that medical boards refer to, but they also teach the boundaries course there and the, the and, and the distress course. 
And we all hear at the end of the course, I wish I had this stuff in my residency because I didn't know. I didn't know I couldn't sleep with a patient. I didn't know, you know, I couldn't prescribe to myself. I didn't know, you know, that it's not okay to yell at somebody. You know, that last one's kind of like, really? You should have known that. But uh, that they're, they don't teach that stuff in residency. They, they just do not. So it's important. You're absolutely right, Dr. Allen, that it's important to have those lectures early in your career and, and to, to be aware. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Barron. This was very informative. Um, thank you very much for being a part of our, our symposium as well. Um, at this point, um, I would like to let everybody know that we're uh, going to take a break um, and we will be back at um, about eh, 1117. Um, so a quick break, um, but there's a lot more. Uh, the panel discussion is next. We're really excited um, for, for that. So um, stay tuned.